uh, public session. As, we've core, as we have a quorum, I call the meeting to order, and apologies have been received this morning from Deputy uh, Kathleen Function. Uh, I'd also remind you the usual reminder about the mobile phones, if you could either turn them off or flight mode, not just for the meeting purposes, but because of the recording and broadcast. In accordance with the standard procedures agreed by the Committee on Procedure and Privileges for paperless committees, all documentation for the meeting has been circulated to members on the document database. I propose we go to private session to deal with correspondence and certain other matters. Is that agreed? Good morning um, and welcome to your uh, team with you as well. Before the meeting commences, I wish to draw your attention to the fact that by virtue of Section 17.2.1 of the Defamation Act 2009, witnesses are protected by absolute privilege in respect of their evidence to this committee. However, if you are directed by the committee to cease giving evidence in relation to a particular matter and you continue to so do, you are entitled thereafter only to a qualified privilege in respect of your evidence. You are directed that only evidence connected with the subject matter of these proceedings is to be given and you are asked to respect parliamentary practice to that effect. Where possible, you should not continue nor make charges against any person, persons or entity by name or in such a way as to make him, her or it identifiable. Uh, the opening statement submitted to the committee will be published on the committee website after this meeting. Members are reminded of the long-standing parliamentary practice to the effect that they should not comment on, criticise or make charges against a person outside the House or an official, either by name or in such a way as to make him or her identifiable. Uh, Minister, you're welcome. And I understand, just for the members here, that separate, I appreciate, I suppose, uh, the fact that you are here at this point in time, because I understand there are other talks going on in terms of government formation. So from the committee's point of view, uh, I'm glad you were able to make this this morning and appreciate your... So, Minister, if you'd like to uh, make your opening, opening statement, and then we'll take questions and comments from the committee members. Thanks very much, Chairman. Firstly, I want to thank the committee members for inviting me to discuss the important challenges that this country must address as regards housing and homelessness. I also want to wish the committee well in its work. I hope that the work of this committee will stimulate debate on further actions that may be warranted to address the, the constraints uh, impeding the housing sector. Indeed, these issues were an important priority for the outgoing government. However, success in overcoming these problems has been slower than all of us would have liked. The findings of this committee will, I am sure, provide a new impetus. Firstly, I'll introduce my officials, uh, Mr. John McCarthy, Chief Economist in the Department, Mr. John Hogan, Assistant Secretary, Banking Division, Mr. Gary Tobin, Assistant Secretary, uh, Tax Policy, Mr. Declan Reid, Specialist in the Department's Sharing Management Unit, Mr. David Hagerty, Principal Officer in the Economics and Budget Division, Mr. Jerry Kenny, Principal Officer in the Tax Division, and Mr. Seamus Millen, Principal Officer in the Tax Division. To begin, I would like to outline my analysis of the current problems facing the housing market. Ireland is in the midst of a significant housing shortage, which is forecast to persist for the next number of years. The shortage is particularly pronounced in Dublin and in the other main urban areas. From an economic and social point of view, the continuation of this housing shortage is of concern. Uh, unless addressed, it could pose a serious threat to competitiveness of the economy. The housing shortage is also giving rise to major social issues, including rising homelessness, driven by pressures in the rental market. It is clear that the problems we are faced with is primarily on the supply side. Thus, policy needs to focus on the supply side factors, such as building regulations, the planning process, development levies, infrastructural constraints and construction costs. As regards the demand side, various factors, including the macroprudential rules, have better aligned purchases, borrowing capacity with income levels, and would appear to have had a dampening effect on house prices, particularly in Dublin. In tackling these problems, primary responsibility for housing policy lies with the Minister for the Environment, Community and Local Government. However, home building is a complex process that involves the land, construction, property and finance markets, as well as tax, social welfare and legal systems. Therefore, there is a need for a holistic, cross-government approach. <coughs> for my part as Minister for Finance, the Department of Finance and I have proactively addressed those issues that fall within our remit.
We continue to engage with other relevant departments and work closely with the Minister for the Environment and his department on the stabilising rents and boosting supply package unveiled last November. I will now outline activity underway in my own department to address some key issues. The requirement to develop a sustainable financing model for the property sector is one that has received much attention. There is now a growing acceptance in the sector that sustainable financing for development requires a mix of equity and debt financing appropriate to the risk of the project. This is a departure from the 100% debt financing model that contributed to the crisis. The transition to a new equity-based financing model is underway but will take time given uh, the changes in behaviour required. This new financing model will help ensure a uh, productive and efficient construction and development sector and reduce the risks of a re-emergence of a credit bubble. My department has worked to help smooth this transition. For example, last year we organised a conference on development finance options that, would, uh, that brought together developers with various banks and equity finance providers. In addition, the officials in finance worked with the ISF uh, and the commercial banks, with the banks partnering uh, with providers of mezzanine debt uh, to ensure that financing is available for development projects. For example, the Ireland Strategic Investment Fund launched a new 500 million joint venture, Active Aid Capital, to make funding available to the house building sector and support the construction, construction of over 11,000 new homes. This fund will address a gap in the financing market as it will provide up to 90% of the financing requirement of these projects. Turning to mortgage holders, I have taken steps to ensure that the banks provide options for standard variable rate mortgage holders to reduce their monthly repayments. In 2015, I requested a report from the Central Bank on the topic, which was subsequently published on my department's website. I also met with the six main mortgage lenders at this time and outlined my view that the standard variable rate being charged to Irish customers was too high. The banks agreed to review their rates and products and have simple options in place to allow reductions in monthly mortgage payments for SVR customers. More recently, the increasing competitive dynamics evident in the market are benefiting borrowers. In this regard, the Central Bank noted in their recent statistical release that all mortgage rates have declined in the year ending quarter 4 2015, with variable mortgage rates for primary dwelling houses falling by 44 basis points to 3.76% over the year. As regards taxation, there are growing demands for the use of ta the taxation system to support the development of the property market. The committee need not be reminded of Ireland's poor experience with property-related tax incentives in the past. Care needs to be taken with any fiscal incentive designed to stimulate the housing market, no matter how laudable the objective. Indeed, to complement the Department's own analysis, the ESRI was commissioned to analyse the possible role of tax breaks in stimulating housing supply last year. Uh, given prevailing supply constraints, the report found the tax incentives aimed at developers would be unlikely to have much effect on supply. It also noted the tax incentives targeted at home buyers, such as mortgage interest relief, uh, would increase house prices with a limited increase in supply. That said, I have been open to selective interventions in the property market where targeted action can be justified. For example, deputies will be aware of the increased deduction for mortgage interest relief that I introduced in a recent Finance Act for landlords that commit to the provision of rental accommodation for a minimum of three-year period for tenants receiving social housing supports. Another example concerns the private rental market where there is a clear need to professionalise the sector in order to better serve tenants. For this reason, I introduced the Real Estate Investment Trust Tax Regime in the Finance Act 2013. This intervention has been successful in encouraging large-scale investment into the commercial and residential property markets. There are currently three uh, REITs operating in Ireland, Green REIT PLC, IRES REIT PLC and Hibernia REIT PLC. 
With subsequent rounds of capital raising since flotation, it is estimated that the market capitalization of the three REITs is now approximately 2.3 billion euros. I would also like to point out that the IRS REIT PLC, which is purely focused on the residential market, has a property portfolio now consisting of 2,087 apartments. These properties are based in 17 apartment complexes in Dublin County and City. They have the ability to develop, to develop uh, 600 to 650 apartments at the existing complexes, subject to planning and other approvals. In addition, other measures I introduced include the Living City Initiative, uh, where admittedly take-up of the scheme has been initially slower than anticipated. However, the home renovation incentive has been very successful. This incentive generates employment in the tax-compliant construction sector, increases sales, and provides supports for homeowners and landlords for building works. Uh, as of the 1st of April 2016, works on over 37,500 properties have been notified to the Revenue HRI online system. This represents more than 845 million worth of works involving some 7,500 contractors. The potential total cost of the exchequer in respect of these properties is approximately 59 million. NAMA is frequently suggested as a one-stop solution to housing issues. Let me be clear, NAMA has a commercial mandate to achieve maximum return to the state. That said, NAMA has utilized this commercial remit to contribute to housing supply in a number of ways. For example, NAMA will uh, fund developments on completion of housing units on sites, securing its loans, uh, where this has proven to increase the ultimate return. NAMA has also innovated uh, so as to combine its commercial priorities with due consideration of ancillary social contribution and has played a very important role in facilitating on a commercial basis the supply of social housing. Following a review last year, NAMA concluded that the value maximizing strategy for some sites under its control uh, was to fund on a purely commercial basis the delivery of up to 20,000 residential units by the end of 2020. This activity will mainly focus on starter homes, reflecting consumer demand and viability. Separately, NAMA, again on a commercial basis, offered just over uh, 6,600 residential units to local authorities for social housing, of which demand was confirmed for about 2,500, and over 2,000 have been delivered. Therefore, it is clear that NAMA has played, and I am sure will continue to play, an important role in addressing our housing needs while fulfilling its commercial mandate. To conclude, there is a need for a continued improvement in the supply of housing as it is vital for the economy's performance and to address social problems including homelessness. As I have outlined, the outgoing government has played its part through its policy actions. I have highlighted uh, above the others. Uh, for example, the recently stabilizing rent and boosting supply package included targeted development contribution rebates for starter homes in Cork and Dublin while new flexible apartment planning guidelines will reduce apartment construction costs by 20,000 per unit. It is important to bear in mind that these measures were introduced quite recently and it will take some time for the full effect to be realized. Moreover, there is no quick fix to the housing shortage. In designing appropriate policy responses, I would stress that there is a need to be careful of the unintended consequences of any intervention, however well-intentioned. For example, I would have concerns about the plethora of proposed demand-side interventions. International evidence indicates that such policies are not appropriate and unlikely to be effective in alleviating the current supply shortage. I would urge the Committee to bear this in mind. Uh, thank you very much. I look forward to your discussion, and uh, I hope to be in a position to answer your questions uh, with the help of my officials. So, uh, with your permission, Chairman, I'll call to uh, address you directly on certain questions. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Minister. We'll go directly to the questions. Uh, the first person presenting for questions, Deputy Butler. Um, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Minister, and the officials for attending and for your um, 
your report there. Um, the questions I have for you, um, a lot of the submissions that we have received already from different organisations who have been in with us, and especially the Construction Federation, quite a few of them have suggested that the VAT rate from 13.5% should be reduced in some instances to 9% and maybe even reduced to zero to try and stimulate um, the, the construction industry. Uh, I was just wondering what your thinking on that is and also the, the fact that 36% of the cost of building a house, I believe is 36%, uh, goes directly to the exchequer. Um, your thoughts on that as well, whether if there was a reduction there would it stimulate more house buying? Um, my second question is in relation to the Living City initiative. I'm just wondering why the take-up has been slow on that and is there any way that we could um, fast-track it maybe? And the third question is, um, do you think that the local authorities have a larger role to play in supplying social housing and affordable housing? Because we had the um, representatives from the city and county councils group and they all, what they stated was that they're, they're actually um, not developers, they're not builders and that they would only ever supply between 10 and 15 percent of the amount of housing would be needed anyway. So do you feel that they should have a larger role to play to maybe try and stimulate um, the housing industry in this country? Thank you Minister. Thank you very much indeed Deputy. Uh, on the VET, it's something we look at. Uh, there was a document published uh, earlier in our discussions for forming a government where we signalled this as a, a possible initiative that could be taken. Uh, we were six months in government and two, six weeks in government in 2011 when we reduced the VAT on the tourist industry from 13 and a half to 9. And uh, the tourist industry would attribute this to uh, lifting the tourist industry uh, off the floor at a very early stage and turning it into the very fine, viable industry that we have now. Uh, so it's worth looking at. There are other considerations that should be taken into account as well, though. If we were to do 13.5 down to 9 in the next budget, uh, the cost is $210 million. But if we use the same $210 million because of the way the fiscal rules operate to provide extra capital for social housing, you can, you can account for capital in consuming fiscal space over a four-year period. Uh, so you get a bigger bang for your buck if you put it into capital. And in gross terms, you could generate about 800 million of activity for the same 200 million. And yet, from an accounting point of view, it would have a much smaller impact on the resources available to us. Uh, that's worth the consideration as well. Uh, the other point I'd like to point out, and, and we've made no decision on this yet now, I'm, I'm giving you my thoughts as we move towards the budget where we probably will make a decision. Uh, a lot of the submissions, with all due respects to the Building Federation, the Construction Industry Federation, are in the interests of builders. Now, I mean, that's their job. They represent the industry. They don't represent the purchasers. So it's important to remember that. So if I could give a tax break, which would put money in the pockets of purchasers, rather than money in the pockets of builders. Uh, I'd, I'd be more favourably disposed to it. So we're looking, we're looking at, first of all, at uh, you know, the marginal advantage in using the same amount of money for capital as against uh, tax breaks. And secondly, then, uh, is there a mechanism for directing the money to the purchasers? Uh, the model I'm looking at is the very successful tax break for home extensions. And I've given you the statistics on that, which generated an enormous amount of activity at a very low cost. 59 million, seven and a half thousand contractors working, and literally 30 or 40 thousand homes affected. Uh, so the, their model is that the revenue have a unit. <coughs> and you, you apply online if you're doing a home extension, but it's the person who does the home extension, who gets the money back through the tax system. So we're looking at a model like that to see. So no decision made yet, but it, it, it's 
under active consideration in the talks that are taking place elsewhere, but it's also under active consideration uh, in, in my department. Now remind me of your second point, your second question. It was, it was in relation to the Living City initiative. You were saying yeah. the take-up wasn't great, and I'm wondering, is there any way you, it could be revamped a little bit? Or? The take-up was very slow. A lot of that is to do with, uh, you know, the building industry being on the ground anyway, and, uh, you know, people not, not going in. Uh, the other, it's, it was directed by and large at uh, kind of old Georgian houses that were in disuse, especially in Limerick and in parts of Dublin. And there are a lot of constraints, planning constraints, on the development of those kind of houses. So they're more, probably more expensive to do. And then there are issues we confined it to the tax break to owner occupiers rather than to developers. So it's early days yet. Uh, a lot of these schemes start very slow and then there's an active take-up as the economy lifts. So Would a lot of these houses have preservation orders on them as well? Yeah. Yeah. That makes it more expensive to deal yeah. with. Them, you know? uh, look, it's, it's one of these things where I think your chairman knows my approach to these things. You do something, you hope it works. If it doesn't work, you try something else or you modify what you did. And, uh, you know, we, we, we keep it under review. Uh, if there is no take-up, we'll have to revisit it. Now, I'm reluctant to extend the benefits to uh, the developers rather than to the owner occupier uh, because we tried all that before and you got the activity, but you got a lot of problems with it as well. But again, uh, I'd welcome the recommendations of the committee on it and we'll provide you with all the statistics. And you're absolutely right. Uh, the take-up has been disappointing, but there has been some take-up. And as the economy strengthens, I would hope there'd be more take-up. Thank you. And your third question? third question was in relation to the role of uh, city and county councils. Do you feel that they have a larger role to play in, in providing social housing and affordable housing? Because there's a, there's <coughs> a major change back around, I think, to back around 2004, in the role of local authorities in the provision of uh, social housing. And the movement was away from uh, the councils uh, constructing uh, what we used to call council houses uh, to having money to purchase them on the market. And I must say I was one of the strong supporters of the new policy, even though it was introduced by a Fianna Fáil minister, because, you know, all the arguments about social mix and not developing ghettos that were all local authority houses. And by purchasing in in other private estates, you were getting the mix. So that all worked. But you see, there's a problem now of supply of private housing. Uh, so there aren't houses available, really, for the purchasing model to work successfully. So I think it's time for the local authorities to get more directly involved again. Now, they've been given a lot of money. They've been given several billions for the next five years for social housing. And I think the new model is that they should have organisational units for the building of houses, but a lot of the construction could take place under the auspices of the voluntary housing agencies who are still in the construction business and have the capacity uh, to do it. So some model like that. But the other problem is that there seems to be a difficulty in getting clearance from the Department of the Environment. Uh, through to local authorities for our building houses. Someone told me, uh, you probably know, but I don't know whether it's correct or not. Someone told me there's kind of eight jumps you have to get over now if you're a local authority to get full clearance from a local authority. Uh, I think it would be national policy to reduce that. There still has to be some authority at uh, Department of Environment or new Department of Housing level. But if we can take the unnecessary red tape out of it, and move it forward because we're in a crisis and you know move, move it forward more quickly the other thing is i think the local authorities have discretion uh, to uh, 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 under their own authority uh, to have developments up to a value of about three million and i think that ceiling should be increased but maybe up to five you know i think they need greater discretion to act uh, autonomously and uh, again you know, I, I, you know, obviously, if we're successful in forming a new government, we'll have a big policy section on housing and on homelessness. But 
I, I, I wouldn't like to close the door on it and pretend that those little formal government have a monopoly of knowledge in this area. Uh, so we'll, we'll put uh, doors into our new policy to say, taking into account the recommendations of the Special Housing Committee. Uh, so that there's a, an easy feedback in, so that we can adapt your proposals, uh, and uh, you know, work. I mean, I under if I understand new politics, this is the way we should work. Adre address problems and see can we come up with solutions with with the best thinking that's around the place. Minister, just in, in re before I take the next two questions, just in response to your reply in relation to the, the VAT element, you mentioned it had an annual cost of 200 million. That's in a no change scenario. Obviously, if uh, output is increased, uh, the, the, it could be cost neutral or there could be a, a, a benefit to the exchequer. So I suppose we need to bear that in mind. And the other, the other comment you made was you wanted to put money in the pocket of the purchaser. And I suppose the committee is looking at it slightly differently, is we're trying to bring the cost down that would allow people meet the central bank guidelines. So that's the balancing act. Rather than actually giving money, the cost seems to be beyond what the central bank will allow for a lot of people. Um, so that's the way we're looking at it. Um, you needn't comment. I, I just, you, uh, the, your first point, uh, you know, that if you reduce taxes, they pay for themselves. You know, only if you increase output. If it yeah. results in an increase in output. I mean, I'm around for a good while, and I, I have been looking for a self-financing tax break for years, and I haven't yet found one. <laughs> so <laughs> while I'd agree with you that the gross cost mightn't be the gross figure, there is no there is no self-financing tax break that I know of. There's always a cost to the exchequer for any tax break. But people looking for tax breaks always say, this will pay for itself. That's the opening position. So we'll give you the best data possible when you're assessing this. But they're not self-financing. There's always a cost. And, uh, but we'd hope that the output would increase. Uh, on how to, how to model it to bring the house down, the, house, the price of houses down, I, one of the fundamental problems for the last couple of years is that The replacement cost of a house, uh, you know, by a builder, was below the market price of the house on the market. So, like, who would build if the house next door was cheaper second-hand than available? But now those pressures have increased, and there's a real supply shortage now, and there's a there's a demand driver again now. And I understand that the replacement costs and the purchase price of new houses are, are close enough at this stage now. And there's evidence of that on the market. Since Christmas, and don't pin me to the accuracy of this number, but it's a ballpark figure, uh, in Dublin since Christmas about 80 new sites have opened up uh, for residential. Now some of them are 15 houses, more of them are 80 houses, you know. Uh, some of the big ones then are a planning stage. The biggest uh, property construction developer in the world out of Texas Hines that bought Cherrywood. That's 4,800 units potential there. And they have a different model again, but I mean, they kind of sublet to small builders and so on. And uh, the people, Cairn Homes, you see them, they bought uh, the Ulster Bank, Land Bank. Uh, they're all out your country. West Dublin and on up to Port Marnock, and they have a scatter across the country as well, but it's, it's mostly Dublin. And the big advantage of the big fellas is that they, they can raise money on the market. And so they don't get into this trap that the small builder is in of having to pay 14% for an equity stake. They can raise money at 3%, less, 2%. Uh, so. I mean, the market is correcting itself, but it needs interventions as well, so that it, it corrects itself more rapidly. And there's all sorts of things then that you're looking at, everything from regulation to planning to uh, bureaucratic delays to, to finance, and you know, there's a whole range of stuff. But uh, the market is correcting, but too slow uh, from from our point of view, and I'm sure from your point of view as well. Thank you, Minister. I'll take two sets of questions <coughs> together. Deputy uh, Brazil first, and then Deputy Durkin. 
Thank you, Chairman, and thank you, Minister and officials, for, for attending. Um, just a few brief points I, I raised previously um, around um, the issue that you would sort of different dynamic in different parts of the country. I believe Dublin is very much a supply issue, whereas uh, down in Kerry, where I'm from, you've got a huge amount of empty properties. And going back to the, um, the uh, city or the Living City Initiative or whatever it's called, um, I, I firmly believe that in most towns and villages in rural Ireland, we've got, uh, probably about one in three properties are empty because the parents have passed on and the family members are living elsewhere. Uh, and those properties um, are just lying there and no incentive to do anything with them. And uh, I made a proposal that uh, a grant might be uh, appropriate to the homeowner to do up the property to an acceptable standard and the uh, buy-in or the payback or the condition for the grant would be that the local authority, the house would be made available to, to the local authority on a long-term lease. So again, I, I would hope that something like that would have significant take-up and um, the, the, the um, benefits are self-explanatory. And I don't know if this proposal that you have here is based on those lines, but if it's not, you said if something doesn't work, you look at trying to improve it. Maybe that's something that you, you could look at, because I do think that if a, if a homeowner is incentivized to do up a property with a guaranteed income at the end of it through the local authority uh, rental, I think there's a real win-win there, and I, I'd really like that proposal to, to be looked at. Um, I've had a second issue. I've had significant um, interaction with the Irish League of Credit Unions and um, they believe they really have a very uh, strong and active role to play if allowed but they're very much making the point to me that they're, they're more or less hamstrung in their lending um, abilities and they would like to play a role uh, particularly for the, um, for the, the, the home, single homeowner um, but they feel that they're unable to, and they've made some proposals, I'm sure you've, you've seen them, and I would like your, your uh, ideas and thoughts, and can we get the credit unions in uh, and play an active role in this particular issue to, 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 benefit, to, to add benefit and, and help solve um, some of the crisis. Um, the, um, the, the third point I would just make is that, that the census coming out, I believe, is, there's a lot of information there for to be taken note of very quickly all around again empty properties and because you know is it is it actual or is it just uh, uh, anecdotal and and I think the census will provide every one of us with, with a lot of very important information I need I think we need to take that on board very quickly and you just might for my own benefit minister in the last paragraph um, you expressed concern about proposed demand side interventions you just might explain that to me um, for, for, for my own benefit, I, I don't quite understand what that, that refers to. Mr. If you hold a moment, I'll take questions also from Deputy Durkin. And just to mention to the Deputy, in case he's unaware, the League of Credit Unions are attending this afternoon, so you might like to continue your line of questioning with, with them. I'd be delighted I raised their issues yeah. in their behalf. So. Deputy Durkin. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, my apologies for late uh, entry. In fact, I was meeting a lending institution along with a constituent uh, to discuss uh, mortgage arrears. Uh, one of the many. <clears throat> can I, can I, can I, I welcome the Minister and, and his officials uh, to the meeting. And can I, can I uh, pose three questions? First of all, the immediate problem, the urgent problem, the emergency problem that now presents itself with the large number of uh, fam families in emergency accommodation. Uh, local authorities having insufficient accommodation uh, themselves, uh, having a, a huge number of people on their various housing lists. Uh, on my own local authority, uh, so moving towards 8,000 at the present time and growing. And with the banking repossessions, uh, uh, further adding to that factor, and deep concern amongst the people who are directly affected. Can I ask what uh, immediate steps? Uh, can be can be taken 
from the point of view of the Department of Finance, because as the Minister knows, I've raised this on numerous occasions, made various proposals uh, over the last number of years. And I wouldn't be one of the supporters of the, the private housing or the voluntary housing agencies, as the Minister well knows as well. Uh, that's, that's my problem. But however, uh, in order to get back to addressing the urgent problem of what some people call homelessness, how do we deal with that in the short term? Because we don't have a long term to deal with it. And I, can I suggest, can I ask, the degree to which uh, funding can be obtained by bodies willing to assist the local authorities, and I've made a number of submissions on this, that is, can be registered as off-government balance sheets. This is the, 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 the nub of the problem as far as we've been confronted. Now, while we know that uh, there are constraints that apply to governments at the present time, we do have a problem in this country that a lot of other countries do not have. And how do we address that issue in the short term? Because it is socially and economically unacceptable that we have a large number of people, growing number of people, becoming homeless and nowhere to go. And the social and economic damage to the economy will, will appreciate with the passage of time. So can I, can I again suggest the notion of a, a government bond to fund directly uh, a local authority building programme? And I know the Minister has said, and correctly so, uh, that a large amount of money has been made available, 3.8 billion already, to the local authorities. But it's the immediacy of the problem that we need to, to deal with in the first instance. It, 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 in six months or a year's time, in case that people think uh, somewhere that it will be acceptable to have people still homeless and still uh, living in emergency accommodation, families, uh, whole families living in one room, it's not acceptable. And it won't be possible to, to achieve social stability if that is allowed to continue. And the last point I want to make is this. The government, as we know, as the Minister said, can borrow money relatively cheaply, very, very cheaply. Is there any way that that money uh, borrowed by government can be made available to the local authorities through a medium, through a medium of which there have been a number uh, presented themselves, in order to enable the local authorities to get involved directly in the building programme. And th those are the three issues insofar as I would be concerned, dealing with my constituents, and this is a, a, a problem that's getting worse by the hour. Thank you, Deputy Minister. You have a range of questions. Thank you very much, um, Chairman. <coughs> Deputy Brazel, thank you very much for your questions. Uh, your, your, your country is like my country. I know you're part of Kerry. It's not so different from uh, West Limerick, where I came from originally. Uh, you're right. There are, there's an awful lot of unused property in small towns and villages. But I think a lot of it is uh, because of social reasons as much as economic reasons. Uh, it's the ambition of every young couple who are working not to live in the village, but to build on a half acre on the approach roads to the village. And what has happened as that has developed as the model over the last 30 years is that the villages and small towns are becoming the residential areas for those in social housing. And that has its own economic effect on the village then, because obviously the, the purchasing power is lower and the shops close down and so on and so forth and the people out the approach roads get into their car and they drive to the alleys of the littles of the various big supermarkets and their shop anywhere 20 miles from home, you know. So if we could, if we could come up with a way of encouraging uh, young couples to live inside the speed limits rather than out in the countryside, I mean, I won't get into the environmental advantages that might have. But if you look at it purely as a model of development. Now, if you want to encourage that kind of a model, in my view, it would have to be done through grant schemes, like you suggest, rather than tax breaks. Because tax breaks work at the marginal rate of tax. And if you're young and starting and acquiring a home, you're probably paying tax at the lower rate, 20%. The big advantage on a tax break is if you're paying tax at the higher marginal rate. And uh, a lot of the people who are paying tax at the higher marginal rate have long since provided themselves with a decent home. So you might have a look at, is there a way where the economic balance would be tipped if you said, 
inside the speed limits of towns of a certain size, small, small villages, small towns, we'll provide a grant. And you might figure out uh, at what level that grant should be pitched, if it was to act as an incentive. So I think there's, there's something in what you're saying. Now, whether you would extend that then to original owners, you know, parents die in the owners in Dublin, and they have um, the shop closed down and there's residential area overhead, whether you do that with the intention of leasing that onto the local authorities for social housing, uh, I think that's your idea. Um, I mean, I'd be open to the suggestion. Like, we're in a situation where there's a housing crisis. But there's also the crisis of the, the declining village and small town. And if in solving one, you can solve the other as well. And we need fresh thinking. And that's why you're here as a special committee. So, yeah, I, I'd be very open to that. Uh, the credit unions, uh, I have met them on several occasions. I've told them uh, that we would like to expand their activities uh, into uh, the provision. Uh, of assisting in housing development. The thing you have to remember about the credit unions is two things. First of all, they're regulated by the central bank. The credit union regulator is a senior central bank official, and they're independent in the way they regulate. And the primary uh, concern of the central bank in dealing with credit unions is to protect the savings of those who save in credit unions. Like the only money credit unions have is the money they have from small savers all over the country. And the central bank will not allow them uh, to get involved in activity that's speculative, which would put those savings at risk in any way. Uh, that's not to say now they're putting some money into house building. So I'm talking to them, or my officials are talking to them. We're working on it. Uh, I see a role initially for the credit unions being in a position you know, to supplement uh, the purchase of houses. And uh, you know the kind of things we used to do previously. If they can't contribute to a loan for the purchase of a house, they might be able to give a small loan for, for the kitchen or for the equipment or for the furniture, you know, that kind of model. So you might, you might check it out with uh, the credit unions this afternoon to know what their latest thinking is. One of the difficulties I have as well is when I talk to individual credit unions, uh, they don't seem to have a unified approach. They come up with different proposals. And in dealing with the central bank, there needs to be some kind of general mandate that the central bank will, will agree to. Uh, I, we were talking to um, ISAF and uh, the Pension Reserve Fund as well, who have quite a lot of money. And, I, and, and, and this would be for SME lending now rather than lending for the purchase of houses. And uh, they are developing a program now where they would use the credit unions and the post office as a kind of platform for interfacing with small firms so that they could lend on to them. But the actual uh, analysis of the loan application would be done by these bodies themselves, but the interface would be credit union level. So there's a lot happening, and again, we want suggestions that are viable. But remember, the bottom line for the bank and for me is that whatever the credit unions get involved in, they cannot put the savings that have been trusted to them at risk by advancing money to uh, investments which would be regarded as over-speculative. Uh, I, I think you, 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 you'd agree on that point. Uh, the demand side is, you know, obviously in every economic activity, Deputy Brazel, there's the supply and demand side, and the analysis of the housing issue at the moment is there's just a shortage of houses and we need to build more houses and provide more houses. Uh, the demand side would be giving grants, for example, is the demand side, giving tax breaks to purchasers, trying to do things to reduce the price of houses uh, could increase demand. And, you know, there's two sides to it, so uh, that's, that's the, 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 the things there. Deputy Durkin. Uh, emergency accommodation, you know, I'm not the Minister for, for Environment or Housing and the initiatives coming from, from uh, the emergency accommodation or coming from the uh, Department of the Environment, uh, you'd, be, you'd be aware of them. Uh, there's only one thing I'd like to say is if, if you look at it, 
it's like a lot of things in life. There's a supply and a demand problem, to get back to that equation. And there's a tipping point in it. And there's a tipping point in it where a thousand houses short or a thousand extra houses can drive you from crisis into surplus. Now, I've had a look at the Dublin figures, and while there are around 5,000 people homeless, the average seems to be about five per family. So, in actual fact, if you had over a thousand housing units in Dublin this minute, you, you, you'd solve a lot of the problems. It's, it's a tipping point situation, you know? And, like, I just think that there's some analysis being done that doesn't see the basic economic difficulty and address address that issue. Because, as I say, if you could, I don't know about a thousand, but if you could put 1,500 units into Dublin, you wouldn't have a homeless crisis, you wouldn't have a tipping crisis. So we're not talking about hundreds of thousands of houses. Uh, but the other areas then, and I think you know them pretty well, you know, these homes they're putting up in Finglas now, the, uh, the modular homes, that, that's part of the problem. Uh, the houses that are boarded up, uh, they say the local authorities in Dublin have uh, got a lot of the voids back into usage now recently, and they're doing much better than they were. But if you think of, say, a private landlord, and he has an apartment, and he has bad tenants, and they wreck the place before they leave, and they move on, the private landlord will have that back ready to rent within a month or six weeks, because he wants to get an income flow again. The local authority, if it's wrecked, sometimes it takes two years. I mean, we know that all around the country. So, like, one of the interventions for emergency accommodation, and I think they've done it successfully in Dublin, is to have a policy for the voids and say, local authority manager, it's the policy that you get that back in within two months. You're not waiting for two years. Why should you? If it was a private sector accommodation, it would be brought back like that because they need the income flow to service the loan. So, like, there are a lot of small things as well as big things. Now, again, I'm not prescribing to you, or I'm not saying I have the solutions, and it's not my area. I'm talking to you more as a constituency TD than as Minister for Finance, seeing where the, where the problems are. But again, that, you know, that, that would be, uh, Bernard, that would be where I'd see some of the emergency uh, accommodation. Uh, and then there has to be uh, a fast-track approach to supply that 12 or 1,500 houses uh, here, and it's less in other places. I mean, I'd say down in Limerick, you wouldn't need a 1,000 houses. Uh, the homelessness problem is there, but it's not of the same magnitude, you know. I, don't, I think several hundred houses in Cork would solve Cork. So if you think of it in terms of a tipping point economic problem, and at one side of the tipping point you have an emergency, and at the other side you don't have an emergency. So address that space, I think, is, is one of the suggestions I'd be looking at. Off balance sheet, um, I suppose the opening position is that we're, we're bound by fiscal rules from Europe. And with the referendum we put through, I think it was 212 or 213, the European fiscal rules are a matter of Irish constitutional law now because they were passed by a referendum. So we don't have a shortage of money. We, we, we nearly balance the budget and we can borrow money. The last uh, half billion that was borrowed by the NTME about three weeks ago, they got it at 0.81 percent, you know, well below 1 percent. That's cheap money and it's 10-year money. So there isn't really a shortage of money. It's the capacity to spend the money that constrains us until we balance the budget and get it down to, to balance. So what you need to do in the intervening period is, as you say, Deputy Durkin, try and get expenditure that's not on balance sheet so that it doesn't impinge on the fiscal rules and doesn't take up the notorious fiscal space. Now, that's why I push NAMA quite a lot, because NAMA is 20,000 houses that they have committed. That's off balance sheet. And we want to be very, very careful with NAMA that we don't get them into state aid difficulties, because if we do, I mean, if they do something that's 
uh, competitively uh, not commercial. The private interests in the construction industry uh, have made complaints already to Europe. And if NAMA had to go on balance sheet, well then the option for using NAMA as a vehicle for increasing supply would disappear. But at present they're off balance sheet and they're committed to providing 20,000 houses. Uh, PPPs are off balance sheet. So if you have public-private partnerships and they can be engineered properly, they're off balance sheet. And, uh, you know, there's work being done to see their, the schools being built all over the country on the PPP model. You know yourself that they work on bundles of schools rather than single schools. And, you know, seven or eight schools are put out for tender. And the bundle of schools then can be off balance sheet the way it's engineered. And the other area uh, which I'd like, you might track it yourself, but I, I, I'll track it as well. Somebody told me last week that the French government had done a deal with the European Investment Bank uh, for about three billion uh, to channel.